Dear yes, students, you are welcome to this recording. I'm by name Kidan Robina, and I'm going to take you through anatomy of skeletal system. The skeletal system is composed of bones, cartilage, joints, and ligaments, and we have looked at this before, and I guess you don't have any problem with them right now. Let's, uh, the functions of the skeletal system. The skeletal system helps in support it has a hard framework that supports and uh, anchors the soft organs of the body. Then it also protects vital organs of the body like the brain and the spinal cord. It also aids in movement because it gives attachment to the muscles and hence acts as a liver uh, and helps or aids in the movement of the body from one place to another. Then minerals and lipids are also stored in the bones. Uh, blood cell formation, the bone marrow is responsible for blood cell formation. Let us look at the bone markings. So bone surface is not smooth, but shows uh, bone markings, which reveal where muscles, tendons, and ligaments are attached then also where nerves and the blood vessels pass before. So bone markings may be processes or projections or can be uh, pro or depressions or cavities. So the cavities, these are like the valleys in the uh, bones and the, the projections are those protruding parts of the bone. So the skeletal system, when we look at the skeleton, is a bony framework of the body. The adult human skeletal system consists of 206 bones, as well as a network of tendons, ligaments, and the cartilage that connects them. The skeletal system has two distinctive parts. We have the axoskeleton and the appendicular skeleton. So the appendicular skeleton has a total of eight bones, and it consists of the vertebral column, the ribcage, and the, the skull. Whereas the appendicular skeleton has a total of 126 bones and is formed by the pectoral girdles, uh, the upper limbs, the pelvic girdle, and the, the lower limbs. And their functions are for walking and running. Uh, the skull and the associated bones. So when we look at the skull, we are talking about the cranial bones and the facial bones. So the cranial bones, those that are single, we have the hospital bones. We have the hospital bone, we have the frontal, then we have the sphenoid bones. Then we have the parietal and temporal bones. These are paired. They can be found on both the right and the, the left side of the uh, skull. Then the facial bones, we also have both the single and the paired. And here the single, we have only the vomer. Then in the paired ones, we have lacrimal bones, uh, nasal, inferior nasal cochlea, and zygomatic bones. These ones are paired. So let's look at sutures. Sutures are immovable joints that join skull bones together, and they form boundaries between skull bones. So four, uh, there are four sutures that can be found on the skull. We have the chrono suture, which is found between the parietal and the frontal bones, then the sagittal suture, which is found between the two parietal bones, then we have the, lam the lambdoid suture, which is found between the parietal and the hospital bones. Then we have the squamous, uh, which is found between the parietal and the temporal bones. Then we have also fontanelles. This font, the fontanelles are usually ossified by the age of two uh, in a child. So right there we have a picture which is showing the different types of bones and the, the, the sutures as I have already talked about them. So the skull, the adult skull, the adult skull consists of 22 bones. So among the studies, we have the eight bones that are found in the cranium, and these bones are the frontal, hospital, the two temporals, two parietals, 
sphenoid and the, the ethmoid. Then we have the facial bones, which are 14 in numbers, and the, these are the nasals, the maxillae, zygomatics, mandible, lacrimos, palatines, inferior nasal culture, and the vomer. So skull forms a larger cranial cavity, also forms the nasal cavity, the orbits, paranasal sinuses, mandible and the auditory oscos are the only movable skull bones. Cranial bones also attach to membranes called the meninges and they stabilize positions of the brain, blood vessels, and the outer surface provides large areas for muscle attachment for muscle attachment that move the head or provide facial expressions so you're able to provide the facial expressions because the muscles are attached to the bones and they don't when they move uh, they give that kind of expression so we are looking at the male and the female skull differences we have the differences A, B, C, and D. So the difference A, the male cranial mass is more blocker and massive compared to the females, which are more rounder and tapers at the top. Then the female's supraorbital margin is sharper, while the male's is rather round and dull. Then the difference C, the zygomatic bone is more pronounced on the male skull than in the female. So right there we have a view of the skull bones, even there. So right there we have uh, the frontal view of the skull bone, and that is the frontal bone. Then we have the parietal bone. So the parietal bone is found on both sides. We have the left and the right parietal bone. Then temporal bones, also the same. Then the nasal bone. Then the maxilla, mandible. Then this, we have the lateral view of the skull. And here we have the frontal bone on the lateral view, the parietal bone, temporal bone, nasal, zygoma. Then we have the maxilla and we have the mandible. Then we have the hospital bone, then the mastoid process. Then we have the external auditory meters where the opening of the ear is. So these, when put together, that is what you get to see. So that is the front of you when you look at the skull from the front. Then this is a cross-sectional uh, part of the skull. That is how it can be if cut through across the mouth. Then uh, let us look at clinical significance. Why do we look at uh, all this? So one of the conditions that are significant in relation to this is cranial synostosis. And this is a condition in which one or more of the fibrous sutures in an infant skull prematurely fuses and changes the growth. pattern of the skull and once this happens it becomes a complication so it's very very important for it uh, to be uh, identified and managed then we have the scaphocephaly so scaphocephaly is the premature closure of sagittal suture resulting in small or absent anterior fontanelle then we have plagiocephaly this is the premature closure of coronal suture. So these are the conditions that are of significance to this study. So uh, the cross-sectional anatomy of the skull, that is how it can look when it is cut through cross-sectionally. Then when it is cut through vertically, that's how it can be. So when we talk about the... Uh, facial bones, those are the ones we had already mentioned. And then we have the two nasal, the maxillae are two, zygomatic are two, mandible is one, lacrimo is are two, palatine are two, then inferior nasal puncture are two, then one, vomer. So cavities and the 
foramina of the skull. The skull also contains sinus cavities and numerous foramina. So when we talk about the sinuses, we are looking at those openings or the spaces that are within the skull. Even the, the foramina are like openings that are within the skull. So the sinuses are lined with the respiratory epithelium. Their known functions are the lessening of the weight of the skull, so they make the skull lighter. Then the aiding of resonance to the voice and the, the warming and the moistening of the air drawn through the nasal cavity. So those are the major functions of this. So the fontanelles of the skull. The bones of the roof of the skull are initially separated by regions of dense connective tissue called the fontanelles. So there are, are six fontanelles. One anterior or, and can be called the frontal, then one posterior can be called the hospital, then the two sphenoid can be called the anterolateral, and the two mastoid that can be called the posterolateral. So those are the six important uh, fontanelles on the skull. So right there we have a pictorial which is showing uh, fused the sagittal suture and showing some of the fontanelles that I have mentioned. So right there we have a normal head and the abnormal head. The abnormal one is the one where the uh, osput is flat. It is supposed to protrude, but in this case it is the flat. Paranasal sinuses. So the paranasal sinuses part of a part of the nasal complex and the paired cavities in ethmoid, sphenoid, frontal and the maxillary are lined with the mucous membranes and open into nasal cavity uh, through openings called the ostia. Resonating chambers for voice lighten lighten the skull and the uh, sin sinusitis is inflammation of the membrane. So these um, are some of the things that you need to know about the paranasal sinuses. Another thing is infection can easily spread from one sinus to the other through the nasal cavity because it can be connected. Then can also spread to other tissues. So that is that. Let's look at the vertebral colon. The vertebral colon, this is just a part of the image of the vertebral colon in an adult. So the vertebral colon consists of 33 vertebrae. And here we have 24 individual vertebrae. Then we have the saffron, which is fused. And we have the coccyx, which is fused. So, in simple terms, can be divided into seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar vertebrae, sacrum, and the coccyx, which are fused together. So, right there, we have a picture which is showing from one up to seven. Those are the cervical uh, vertebrae. Then we have the thoracic is also from one up to 12. This is just a part of it. So basically looking at the vertebral column uh, can also be called the spine or the spinal column and the, or the backbone. It's composed of a series of bones called the vertebrae. Can be seen and it's singular. And if singular, can be termed as vertebra. That is, if you are referring to one. If there are many, they are vertebrae. So the vertebral column is a series of irregular shaped bones in the back that connects to the skull. At birth, humans have 33 or 34. So as the human grows, some of these bones fuse. And at the end, an adult were all and at the old age, the person ends up with only 26 uh, separate bones of the vertebrae. 
So this is a, uh, a bony thorax showing the ribs right there. So you can take time and study it. Let's look at the sternum. The sternum is formed from three parts. We have the manubrium, which is the superior part, then the uh, the superior part, and it articulates with the medial end of the clavicles. Then we have the body, which is the bulk of the sternum. And this one, sides, this one, the sides are, the sides articulate from costal cartilage of ribs, that is the two to seven. Then we, we have the xiphoid process, which is the inferior end of sternum. And this ossifies around age 40. So let's look at the ribs. All ribs attach to vertebral colon posteriorly. Two ribs, these are the superior seven pairs of ribs, and they are attached to sternum by costal cartilage. One up to seven. So false ribs, these are the inferior five pairs of ribs, and they attach indirectly to the sternum, and these are eight to ten. Then we have floating ribs. These are the ribs from 11 to 12, and this is because they are short and they have the free ends anteriorly. They are not attached anywhere, whereas these others are attached to the sternum through the cartilages. So right there we have the male and the female our structure of the skeleton, the male one looks to be broader, whereas the female one looks to be narrower. Disorders of the axial skeleton. Abnormal spinal curvatures. And these include the scoliosis. This is an abnormal lateral curvature. Then kyphosis, an exaggerated thoracic curvature and lordosis, an inward lumbar curvature, or can be called the sway bag. A narrowing of the vertebral colon uh, canal, the stenosis of the lumbar spine. So all these are the disorders of the abnormal skeleton. So right here, we have some images that show these abnormalities. Scolio uh, scoliosis, you have seen. The person will bend to one side. Then hypothesis, you have seen how the person bends at the thoracic level. Then right there we have a normal person, then we have a person with the inward bending, which is called the lordosis. This can also be found in pregnant women as the pregnancy grows bigger because they need to balance their body because of the weight that they are carrying. So let's look at the appendicular skeleton. The appendicular skeleton allows us to move and manipulate objects and includes all bones other than axoskeleton. It includes the limbs, which are the upper and the lower limbs, the supportive girdles, which are the pectoral and the, the pelvic girdles. So right there, we have a picture which is showing uh, that uh, the skeleton and the showing us which one is the axoskeleton and the appendicular skeleton. So basically we have looked at uh, some of this, so let us continue. So what are the bones of the pectoral garden, their function and the features? So the pectoral garden consists of a number of bones. Uh, it can also be called the shoulder garden, and it connects the arms to the body, positions the shoulders, provides a base for arm movement. The pectoral garden, here we continue and we look at the different bones. We have the scapula, the clavicle, the jugular notch. So it consists of two clavicles, two scapulae and it connects with the axoskeleton only at the manubrium. Manubrium, we have talked at it, uh, about it, and it is the upper part of the sternum. That one, we have talked about it. So, clavicular sternal joint is the joint that is found between 
the clavicle and the sternum. Remember, he said that the manubrium is that upper part of the sternum. So that connection between it and the clavicle is the uh, that joint that is known as the clavicular uh, sternal joint. So let's look at these clavicles. So right there we have a picture which shows the clavicle and the different parts. You can take time and study it. The clavicles, also called the collarbones, they are long and S-shaped. They originate at the manubrium, which is the external end, and they articulate with the dense scapulae, which is the acromion end. And let's look at the scapulae. The scapula is also called the shoulder blades. They are broad, flat, and triangular, and articulate with the arms and the collarbone. So right there we have the picture of the scapula. The different parts are right there shown. So what are the bones of the upper limbs? Their function and features. The upper limb consists of four segments. We have the shoulder, which is the pectoral girdle, formed by scapulae, clavicles, and manubrium sternum. Then we have the arm, or the brachium, formed by the humeral, connects the shoulder to the elbow. Then we have the forearm, or the ante, antebrachium, formed by the ulna and radius. Then we have the hand, or manus, formed by the capus, metacarpus and phalanges. So right there, we have an image of the humerus showing the different parts. Take time and study it. Let's look at the humerus. The humerus is also known as the arm and is the long upper arm bone and it articulates with the pectoral girdle. Let's look at it the humerus into details. It extends from the shoulder joint to the elbow joint. It has a long cylindrical shaft or body. Most of the shaft surface is smooth except for the deltoid tuberosity. Distally, the humerus joins medially with the ulna and laterally with the radius at the elbow joint. The hum the humeral ulna joint is formed by the polyshaft trochlea of the humerus and the, the trochlea notch of the ulna. The humeral radio joint is formed by the rounded capitulum of the humerus and the concave superior surface of the radio head. So right there we have the, that image that is showing the two bones. We have the radius and the ulna. So the radius and the ulna, these are the bones of the forearm that extends from the elbow to the waist, to the wrist. At the wrist, the radius articulates with the proximal uh, row of, cap, of couple bones to form an ellipsoidal joint. This junction permits the wrist to move into in two planes, that is flexion and extension. At the introduction to anatomy, we looked at what flexion is and what extension is, so there is no doubt about that. Then we also abduction and the adduction. So this study, the head, of the ulna forms a joint with the ulna notch of the radius and these pivot joints allow the radius to rotate around the ulna which turns the palm of the hand or, or what we can refer to as rotation and the supination. So any interosseous membrane spans the distance between the medial edge of the radius and the lateral edge of the so proximally, the head of the radius forms a joint with the radial notch of the ulna. Let's look at the forearm. The forearm is also uh, called the antebrachium and it consists of two long bones. We have the ulna and the radius. 
what is it then? The ulna is the medial, then the radius is the lateral. So right there, we have that image that is showing the risk. So let's look, well, let's continue looking at bones of the hand. So this to the radius and the ulna are 27 bones that form the hand, or what we can refer to as ossa manus. Eight small carpal bones, which we refer to as ossa capi, support the risk or the carpus. They are arranged in two rows, each consisting of four bones. The proximal row of carpal bones is convex, and the two of the bones, that is the scaphoid and the lunate, articulates with the concave distal surface of the radius. This junction permits abduction and the adduction, which is the side-to-side -side movement of the body part, and the flexion and extension, which is the front-to-back movement of the uh, wrist joint. So, distal to the metacarpals are 14 phalanx bones or phalanges. They also, or we can refer to them as the ossa digitorum, which is support the fingers or digits of the hand. Each finger is supported by three phalanges, with the exception of the thumb, which is supported by two. The proximal row of phalanges, which is the ossa phalanx proximalis, articulates with the metacarpals and the middle row of phalanges, which is the ossa pharynx media. The middle row of phalanges articulates with the proximal and the distal rows, which is the ossa pharynx distalis of phalanges. The concave distal row of carpal bones articulates with the five metacarpal bones, which is the ossa metacarpi which give support to the palm of the hand. The concave distal row of carpal bones articulates with the five metacarpal bones, that is the ossa metacarpi, which give support to the palm of the hand. So these are self-explanatory. I don't need to put more uh, into uh, that, so you can just go through and understand them better. So let's look at the risk. The risk consists of eight carpal bones, four proximal carpal bones, and four distal carpal bones, and they allow risk, and this allow the wrist to bend and the twist. Let's look at the metacarpal bones. They are five long bones of the hand. They are numbered one to five from lateral, which is the thumb, to medial. Articulate with the proximal phalanges. Let's look at phalanges of the hand. We have the thumb has two phalanges. That is the proximal and the distal. When we talk about the proximal, is the one that is closer to the body. Then the distal is the one that is a little bit further from the body. So that is why your thumb has only one joint. And this joint is the one that is found between the proximal and the distal phalanges. Then the other fingers of the hand have three phalanges. We have the proximal close, the one that is closer to the, uh, the point of fixation, then the middle, then the distal, which is further away from the point of fixation. So that's why you have two joints, the one that joins the proximal and the middle phalanges, then the one that joins the middle and the distal phalanges. What are the bones of the pelvic girdle, their functions and the features? So the pelvis, the pelvis consists of two ossa coxi, the sacrum and the bay coxis and is stabilized by ligaments of pelvic girdle, sacrum, and the lumbar vertebrae. So right there, we have those bones. So these bones are different, but they are fused together. So they form that, that one structure, which is known as the pelvic girdle. So the ossa coxae, 
The osapoxy is also called the hip bones. This is a this is a strong to bear body weight and the stress of movement. So each is made up of the refused bones, that is the ilium, ischium, and the, the pubis, as we, we have seen in the Victoria uh, before. So let us look at the acetabulum, or what is known as the vinegar cup. The acetabulum is also called the hip socket, and it is the meeting point of the ilium, Ischium and the, the pubis articulates with the head of the femur or the hip joint. So right there, we have a structure of the pelvis. Uh, it is showing the sacrum, the coccyx, the ilium, pubis, and the ischium. So the three, the ilium, pubis, and the ischium are the ones that we are referring to as the ox coccyx. So divisions of the pelvis, the pelvis is divided into two. We have the false pelvis and the, the true pelvis, and it is divided by the rim. So the true pelvis is the one that is the inside one. Then the false pelvis is the one that is the outside one, as showed well by these um, arrows. So let's look at bones of the lower limb. That is the hip bone. There are three bones that fuse together in adulthood to form the os coxa or the hip bone. The ilium bone forms the superior portion of the os coxa. The ischium uh, bone forms the lower posterior portion, and the pubis bone forms the lower anterior portion. So each, um, each hip bone has three articulation sites. The hip bones uh, meet anteriorly at the pubic symphysis joint and they converge posteriorly with the sacrum at the sacroiliac joints. Then laterally, deep sockets called the acetabula accept the heads of these bones. So what are the structure? And the functional differences between the male and female pelvis. So here, the female pelvis is smoother, lighter, and less prominent muscle and ligament attachments. So the attachments are less prominent, whereas for the males, the attachments are more prominent. So when you feel through the vagina, you check inside uh, through the muscles. You can still feel if the uh, those uh, is just spines are prominent. You can feel them, but if they are not prominent, that means that uh, it is uh, a, an ideal female pelvis. So pelvis mod modifications for childbearing. What are those modifications on the pelvis that can aid uh, quick or and complicated childbearing. So one, we have enlarged pelvic outlet, broad pubic angle, which is greater than 100 degrees, then less curvature of sacrum and coccyx, wide circular pelvic inlet, broad uh, low pelvis, ilia project literal ilia project laterally, and the naughty upwards. So those are the modifications on the pelvis that can aid with delivery of the baby. So right there, you can see the difference between the male and the, uh, the other pelvis. So this, the android pelvis is the typical male pelvis, and this can never allow a fetus to go through. Whereas these anthropoids, also has a complication because for it it is longer and it is narrow and it is over shaped so when the baby reaches into the pelvis into the true pelvis the rotation is difficult so it ends up being arrested what we refer to as the deep transverse arrest and in this case we will not be uh, able to be delivered vaginally so it can create complication 
So what are the bones of the lower limbs, their functions and the features? So the bones of the lower limbs, first of all, their functions, they are important for weight bearing and for motion. So these bones include the femur, which is the thigh bone, then the patella, which is the kneecap, the tibia, the fabula, which form the leg, then the tassels, which form the ankle, and the metatarsals, which form the foot, and the phalanges, which form the toes. So let's look at the femur. The femur is referred to as the longest and the heaviest bone in the whole body. So the femur bone, let's look into the details of it. The femur bone extends from the hip to the knee and is the longest and the strongest bone in the body. It is, uh, at its proximal end, the spherical head of the femur articulates with the acetabulum, which is the hip socket of the oscoxa, to form the hip joint. The patella bone form, covers the anterior portion of the femur's distal articular surface and helps protect the knee joint from injury. From injury. So let's look at the anatomical features. It has a head, neck, greater and lesser prochanta, a lateral and medial, epicondyle and condyle, a gluteal, tuberosity. So distally, the femur articulates with the medial and the lateral condyles of the um, tibia to form the knee joint. So when I talk about articulating, it's like they come together. That is what eh, it refers to. So let's look at the patella. The patella is also called the kneecap and is formed within the tendon of quadriceps femoris. The patella is a triangular shaped bone that covers and protects the distal uh, surface of the anterior femur. It is located directly anterior to a groove between the femur uh, condyles called the patella surface. So two facets or depressions on the posterior side of the patella articulate with the medial and the lateral femur condyles. The patella is embedded in the quadriceps tendon, which makes it the largest sesamoid, or what we refer to as tendon embedded bone in the, the body. So right there we have a pictorial, which shows the quadriceps muscles, then we have the uh, quadriceps uh, tendon, and the femur bone and the patella bone. So this is a pictorial showing the tibia and the fibula. fibula. So the smaller bone is the fibula and the bigger bone is the tibia. So it can take time to study them. So let's look at the tibia. The tibia is also known as... So the tibia is also known as the shin bone and supports body weight and is larger than the fibula. The medial is larger than the fibula and is medial to fibula. So it means it is towards the middle line of the body. <laughs> the fibula attaches muscles to feet and the toes and is smaller than the tibia and lateral to fibula. So bones of the ankle or the tassels, we have the talus, calcaneus, or the heel bone. Then uh, these are important on uh, transferring weight to the ground and the attach Achilles tendon. The ankle, the ankle is also known as the tassels and it consists of uh, seven tassel bones. Metatarsal bones. The metatarsal bones, there are five long bones of the foot and they are numbered from one to five. Mid, that is from medial to lateral and they articulate with the, the toes. The toes or the phalanges. 
The phalanges are bones of the toes. Then we have the hallux, big toe, or uh, big toe, and they have two phalanges. The, that is the distal and the proximal. Other four toes are also uh, having three phalanges. That is the distal, uh, medial, and the proximal. Then let us look at the feet arches. Arches transfer weight from one part of the foot to another. So arches of the foot. Bones are arranged to form three strong arches. That is two longitudinal, that is medial and lateral, and the one transverse. That is ligaments and tendons, and the one transverse. So ligaments and tendons help to hold the bones firmly in the HD position but still allow a certain amount of springiness. Weak arches are referred to as flat foot. Let us look at articulations or joints. So what are the functions of this? Their function is to hold bones together. Then they allow bones to move. And all bones articulate with at least one other bone except for the hoid bone. The hoid bone is the bone that is found around the neck and the for it it does not articulate or it does not attach itself to any other bone. Classification of joints. So we have the functional classification which focuses on the amount of movement. Uh, that is, we have the synathrosis amphiathrosis and the diathrosis. Then we have the structural classification which is based on whether fibrous cartilage or a joint cavity separates the bony regions at the joint. Then as also a general rule, fibrous joints are immovable whereas the synovial joints are freely movable because they have the synovial fluid in them that lubricates them whereas the fibrous joints are held together by the fibrous muscles. So the types are right stated there. We have the amphiathrosis. Under this, these are slightly movable, and they are the axoskeleton, and they are connected by cartilage. And here we have also intervertebral joints and the pubic uh, synthesis. So these are some of them. And they can slightly be moved, but they are not all that movable, just slightly uh, moved. Then in synathrosis, here there are no movements. They are primarily axoskeleton. These are bones connected with fibrous tissue ligament, for example, skull uh, sutures and the distal, uh, that is the tibia and the fibula. Then we have the diathrosis. These are freely movable and they are also called the synovial, uh, the synovial joints. They are primarily found in the limbs and the plane of movement depends on the joint, where it moves and how it moves depends on the joint. And there is a picture right there showing some of those joints. Then we have the uh, synovial joints. Let's look into them uh, into details. The structure, the, the articular cartilage is mainly the hyaline. Then the joint cavity, they have a space filled with the lubricating fluid, which is the synovial fluid. Then we have the fibrous capsule, capsule which is a fibrous city lined with it a smooth synovial membrane, then a reinforcing ligament, uh, which can be inside or outside the joint capsule. It has synovial fluid, which is viscous and lubricating. Tendon sheath, uh, an uh, elongated bursa that wraps, uh, should be wraps, that wraps around a tendon are subjected to friction. Then many see cartilaginous disc. 
which is found within the joint. So right there we have an example of such a joint and you can see most of those structures that we talked about are right there. Disorders of joints. One is dislocation. Bone is forced out of its position. Reduction is done is done by experts on then is praying excessive stretch on the ligament. Then arthritis, we have inflammation of joints, and this can be acute, usually bacterial, chronic, which can be rheumatoid, osteoarthritis, and the gut uh, arthritis. Thank you so much for being part of this recording. May God bless you.